This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is the Honorable Ellen O'Kane Tauscher, who is a former Democratic member of the United States House of Representatives. She represented the 10th Congressional District for seven terms. In the Obama administration, she also served as Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security Affairs and as Special Envoy for Strategic Stability and Missile Defense. She is the 2013 Matsui Lecturer at Cal. Ellen, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. So glad to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Newark, New Jersey, uh, raised in Hudson County, which is just to the east of Newark. Uh, we're the dead vote Democratic. And, uh, <laughs> I see. And, like uh, Texas, where I'm from. <laughs> well, um, you know, it, it was a great place to grow up. My parents um, had gone to the same grammar school that I went to and uh, high school. And um, my great grandparents, my grandparents on my father's side had immigrated from Northern Ireland uh, as Irish Catholics. And um, my mother's parents uh, had come over, one, one side of the family had come over in the 1890s, the other in the 19, early 1900s. So we were fairly new to the country, but um, you know, it was a great place to grow up. And I went to Seton Hall University in New Jersey, and then I went into New York and lived in New York for 15 years and worked on Wall Street. And, and, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed. I have um, terrific parents. We just lost my mother this, this July. Um, my dad's 86. He reads his New York Times and the New York Star Ledger on his iPad. And mm -hmm. he's right now living uh, in Georgia with one of my sisters. But I have two sisters, younger sisters, and our brother, the baby Jesus. And uh, in every Irish Catholic family, you're always praying for a boy. And we finally got him, uh, my brother Jack, and he's nine years younger than me. And um, you know, we just grew up in a very aspirational family. My parents hadn't gone to college. And uh, the plan was that I would go to college, I would graduate, I would get a job, I would help send the rest of them to college, and that's what happened. And mm -hmm. um, my father was a, a volunteer fire captain, then fire chief in our little town uh, of East Newark. And um, my mom worked, uh, after my brother went to grammar school, my mother worked at the bank from, from nine till noon so she could be home when we got there. And then eventually she went to work in New York and had a great job uh, at a big insurance company and loved it. My dad was a council member in mm -hmm. our town. So in our family, um, public service was something you were meant to do. You did it gratefully and um, as a sense of not only obligation, but as um, a duty. And uh, on Wednesday nights, my mother would work at Bingo at Holy Cross where we went to school. So it just seemed natural to me that that's what you did in your life when you got a chance, and um, I was, I'm was i very blessed that I did get a chance to do it. And, and uh, any teachers that you had when you were still in high school, uh, before college, that, that really influenced you? But it sounds like you were getting a lot of influence at home for about family, religion, and public service. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I was just, um, I lived a very blessed life. Um, I was head majorette. I was on the town. I was on the student council. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a very homogeneous place. Uh, most people in East Newark and Harrison, which uh, were basically operated like one town, uh, everybody that went to Holy Cross, a lot of kids went to Catholic high school. I, I chose to go to Harrison High School, and um, you know, lots of our lots of kids went to um, community college or college. Uh, but most of their parents hadn't been in college. Uh, and at the time, Otis Elevator, uh, Westinghouse were part of the uh, manufacturing part of Harrison. And um, 
you know, most people had blue collar jobs. My dad had a white collar job. He was a grocery store manager. And, um, you know, he worked very, very hard. Um, during the arc of my father's 45 years in the grocery business, they went from working um, Monday to Saturday from about eight till seven mm. to working 24 hours a day and then working, you know, working seven days a week, then 24 hours a day. And so, um, you know, it's a physically demanding job. You're on your feet all the time. Um, my father's store was robbed. One of his stores was robbed once. And it mo he moved to a bigger store. That was robbed. He was, you know, held at gunpoint. Um, but, you know, he, he did a great job. He was, we used to call him the mayor of the shop, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and whatever story he was operating in because he, he knew people by name, he would say hello to them. And he believed that customers had to be treated uh, with respect and um, that you wanted them to come back because the business was going to morph into a business of commodities and you were going to go to a store because it was clean, the people were friendly, and you were going to find what you wanted. Mm -hmm. And I think he was ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, you know, I'm lucky that he's still alive. What did you major in in college? Well, I, I started out with a business degree, um, but I was one of the few women in the classes, and I thought that was pretty isolating. So I actually, my degree is in early childhood education, which I've never used professionally, but I have used personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but you actually, later in life, actually created a, a book, right. uh, a source book for, for uh, caretakers for children, right. for the working mom, I guess. Yeah, yeah. you know, I... Um, I was very old when my daughter was born. I was 39, and I had already had my business career, and I had already, um, my former husband and I had a very big business and uh, had done very well. But, you know, when you needed to have somebody help you, my daughter was very premature when she was born. She was in a body cast for 18 months, and so I needed help um, just to be able to get um, some sleep. And um, no matter how much Bill was doing, I still needed some help. So when I went to find some people to help me, I found out that you could basically hire people, but you knew nothing about them. Mm -hmm. And there was no way, uh, and I, was, I had a lot of resources. And it wasn't like I was leaving for eight or nine hours to go to work and um, hoping that everything was going to turn out all right for my child. And I just believed that parents needed more resources. But this was in the early 90s. I think I was a little ahead of my time. And people really were interested in having quality people, but their choices were driven by cost. And um, there was a lot of, you know, crossing their fingers and crossing their toes and hoping and praying everything was going to be fine. Uh, but it was difficult for people to really find quality child care at the cost they needed, and they needed, they needed it, so they paid the cost. Um, but I did write a book, uh, the Child Care Source Book, that gave parents some information, and it had software with it on how to do a background check, and had a had, to encourage people to understand that if you're going to have someone that's going to work in your home and take care of your child, make sure that you are managing them, that you're paying them legally, uh, and that you're giving them, um, you know, good, good background of how to do a good job and the support that they needed. It, it sounds like that from your, your family background and your education, you, you really developed a sense both of how things work the bigger picture, but also uh, the public good, strangely enough. In other words, so you had a problem with daycare or right. you were, had a challenge, but, but you broadened that to, to help others. Well, I, I've always considered myself to be the luckiest girl in the world. So if I consider myself to have a problem with somebody, I look behind me and I think there's probably four or five million people behind me with the same kind of problem. And then I've always, uh, but I, I've, you know, I was successful at a very young age on my own. I married somebody who was successful. Um, and those resources I considered to be um, a signal to me to be able to help the people that were with me that were having a problem like I was having. And um, the worst thing is, you know, did you ever talk to somebody about something and they said, oh, yeah, you know, I, know, I, I, know, I went through that problem two years ago and I did this, this, and this. And you, th and you think, well, why didn't you tell somebody? What'd you keep it a secret for? And so my. You know, not that I'm the fount of all knowledge, but if I figure out a problem, if I identify a problem and figure out, figure out a solution, I want to be able to have no one else go through the same thing I went through. 
and try to get um, at least some information out there for people in a way that's accessible and credible so that they can make their own decisions. You, you've been a, both a, a, a congressperson and a, uh, a diplomat, and I, I always like to ask my guests what skills are involved in, in, in the work that you do and, and what is the temperament that it takes. So let's talk about being a, a political person. What, what, are, what, what, what do you see as the, the skills involved? Well, I think to be in public service, there's a difference between being a politician and being a, an elected in public service, but uh, they're part of the same type of job. I think the best, most important skill is to be able to listen. You have to really be able to listen to people, understand what they're saying, understand what is uh, their passion, what their, what their situation is, uh, and put yourself in that situation. And um, in the case of being in the Congress, when I represented the 10th District, which was Contra Costa, Solano County, and a little part of Alameda County, um, I considered myself to be a rep their representative. You know, just like in the olden days when people got around a, a small village and decided they were going to send one of, their, one of their own to represent them in Washington. They were going to make a sacrifice to do it. They were going to give up their farm, their job, whatever they were doing. They were probably going to leave their family for some period of time. Um, the, the people that they were representing were going to help them keep their family safe, maybe bring in the hay. And in, in exchange for that, the person represented them representing them was going to speak for them. And the only way you can do that is to actually understand what they want and listen to them. And you know, you go back to Washington and you have to remember that you do know more than they do because you're in the meetings and you're understanding. But you don't know better than they do. That is your constituents. Your yeah, constituents. Yeah. And, and part of your job is to come back then and relay what the experience is. You know, you sent me to go do X. I went back and tried to do X. Um, these are the reasons why it's hard to do. These, these people are saying this. These people don't want to do it for their own reasons. I'm pushing to try to go forward. My suggestion is, is that we do these two things. What do you think? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ping pong ball game. You have to go back and forth. And so I really enjoyed being in the Congress because I got to go back and forth between my constituents and Washington and represent them and then go, come back from Washington and say, this is what I'm hearing. This is what those people want to do. In order for me to get this, I have to make these kinds of compromises or I have to agree to what these other people want for their own reasons. That, that's fine. That seems fine. I think these compromises are reasonable. I think if we do those things, we're going to get what we want. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then have them agree with me and then go back and get it done. And that's, that's what I loved about the job. I considered myself enormously blessed to represent my constituents. I thought they were not only smart because they had elected me seven times, because they were smart. In my district, very much like this part of the Bay Area, I had one of the highest voting constituencies in the country. So, you know, I didn't have 10 or 15, 20 percent of my constituency voting. I had upwards of 60 or 70 percent of my constituency voting. So I felt very empowered because I had hundreds of thousands of votes of people and I represented a swing district and I had Democrats, Republicans and Independents voting for me and I got more votes every time I ran. So, so what about temperament? What uh, sounds like patience is very important as you're listening. What else? Well, I'm not a very patient person. It is the <laughs> thing that will get me in the end, um, but I am a disciplined person. Um, so, so in the end, patience, uh, I, I'm still not patient, but I am disciplined. So I, I have forced myself to do that. And, um, you know, it's difficult because it's so easy to turn, it's, it's easy to turn um, dissent or cynicism or uh, a lack of agreement on an idea into a personal confrontation. And that is the destruction of politics and public policy. And so this, the best thing to do is to stay serious and sober about it and to try to stay on the idea and to keep people away from the other. Um, you know, there's many advantages to the advent of all of the technology that we have. But some of it 
is very snarky and mean-spirited and uh, anonymous. And there's nothing like anonymity to breed personal attacks and um, cynicism. And those are destructive forces for public policy and for good politics. And so there's, you know, I, I think that in many ways we're out of balance on some of these things. But I think that in the end, all of this information, all of this ability for people to tap in is much better. Uh, but I do think that constituents can be lazy. People can be, they're very, they're very busy. They're, there's lots of reasons why you don't want to pay attention to this. And so I think that that's part of um, been the downturn in, in our public discourse in the last few years is that um, we have hyper-partisanship because of gerrymandering and we should all demand national nonpartisan redistricting like we have in California uh, and uh, for the nation. And, um, you know, there's, there's this kind of cynicism that has become chic, you know, to, to snipe at people in Congress and stuff. And if you continue to do that, you're going to get people that you don't deserve and that don't deserve to be in Congress. And um, that's not going to be good for anybody. When you first ran, I guess in, in the late 90s, 96, 96 you, it was a Republican district. Right. What, what was the challenge there uh, to get a conversion from being represented by a Republican uh, uh, to you running as a Democrat? Was it about uh, public education? Uh, was, was it a different time also? Was it easier to do that? Well, it was effectively, after the 90 census and the 91, the 91 redistricting, uh, there was a court decision that this part of Contra Costa County, or this part of the Bay Area, was more Republican, and that it deserved to have a Republican represent. And so the seat was drawn by the courts, a special master, to make it a Republican leading district. And um, the assemblyman at the time, Bill Baker, was retiring because of term limits and the seat was basically drawn for him and he won in 92 and then he won in 94 with 57 percent of the vote. And then when I ran in 96, um, by then people knew more about him. Um, he was way too conservative socially for the district. Uh, he had been in the Congress in 92, but 94 he had been eclipsed by the by the people that had overtaken the Democrats and took, taken the majority, and he wasn't a very effective member. Plus, he was mean-spirited and would say things that were just a little out of bounds. And so, um, when you're going to offer a change to people, you have to do two things somewhat simultaneously. One is you have to make them convinced that they don't want what they have, and that you are a better replacement for that. And um, I had a fabulous friend of mine, Katie Merrill, uh, who ran my campaign. Um, Washington didn't believe I was going to win. Nancy Pelosi was, was um, a very senior and distinguished member of the Congress, but she wasn't in the leadership. I didn't get any money from Washington. Uh, I raised a million dollars. I used um, about that amount of my own money, which I've never paid back. And um, I beat him. I beat him by about 5,000 votes. He, he, didn't, he didn't actually, um, you know, give up until about two days mm -hmm. later. But, um, you know, I, I knew that I was more like the people in my district. My district was a successful sp suburban district. Uh, but, you know, his record uh, on choice and other things uh, were very much against where the women in the district were, either, even the Republican women. But I think his biggest mistake was, if you remember the, the tragedy, we just had the anniversary of the 101 California street murders. And one of my constituents, Steve Spazzato's wife, was murdered. And he, um, you know, our great senator, Dianne Feinstein, had the assault weapons ban. And Steve uh, wanted Bill Baker to vote for it. And Bill Baker not only voted against it, but then wouldn't meet with him. Mm -hmm. And that um, appropriately energized Steve and so it was a number of different things, but mostly I think it was that he was um, too conservative, a little tone deaf. So, so I, I'm hearing you say that it, it's, it, when you move beyond listening, it, it's really about articulation and, and uh, being able to articulate 
that different vision. That's right. While at the same time keeping your humanity, Try. basically, because reaching out to somebody who, who suffered a tragedy is, is a very human, one-on-one right. uh, -on -one kind of... But public uh, policy is about humanity. Mm -hmm. the, why do we have public policy? We have public policy because, because human beings are um, not only fallible, but they are vulnerable. And people are vulnerable for many reasons. Some are vulnerable from the moment they are born, and they need to have societal protection, or they have something that happens to them and they become vulnerable. They may be transactionally vulnerable for some short period of time. They lose a job. They lose uh, their parents uh, at a young age, where, where society has to step up and has to supplement and has to support and has to do so for everyone's good. The beneficiary is that person at that moment, but we are all the beneficiary because we cannot allow to have other people in our community um, who are lagging behind and who are suffering. That is not what anybody believes is, is right. So public policy is the formalized articulation of how we put our thumb on the scale and begin as a society to help those that, that need help, uh, whether it's for their lifetime or for a part of their lifetime, um, all with the idea that we are meant to be self-sufficient and that we're meant to promote that and that we're meant to celebrate that. But that also puts the burden on those that have the ability to be self-sufficient to be able to help because there can't be anybody in your community that is suffering that you could have helped that you didn't, that sustain. How, how did uh, your uh, business experience uh, inform you when, when you, you know, became uh, both a congressperson and, and a leader in the Congress? So I went to Wall Street um, at 22 after graduating from Seton Hall with an education degree. This was a time when, you know, this was 1970, Four and Wall Street was um, changing fundamentally. Um, you know, all of the all of the names that you know. You know, Merrill Lynch. There really was a Mr. Merrill, Mr. Lynch. I was at a firm called Beige. There was a Mr. Beige. Dylan Reed, same thing. And so these were firms that were had been started under the but the legend goes under the Buttonwood tree um, down on Wall Street. You know, in the 1700s. Uh, when the exchanges started to form up, the New York Stock Exchange and then the American Stock Exchange. And, um, you know, they were started by individuals. They were, they were small little corporations, and they populated their firms with their family, sons, nephews, male cousins, always male, uh, brothers, brothers-in-law. You know, they stretched it pretty much as far as they could. And when the band snapped, when they just didn't have anybody with their last name, then they started to <laughs> figure out, well, okay, well, the, I have a fraternity brother from school. I have somebody that belonged in that society at Yale with me. You know, they all went to the elite schools, so that's how they populated things. Then eventually the band snapped again. Well, they ran out of fraternity brothers. Now they're in the uh, 1900s, and um, the business is now moved from the egalitarian to everybody. Now, lots of people have want to invest, lots of people, um, including corporations with pension plans. So the demand for bodies is huge. And they, then they're, they're really stuck. And so they started finding people from Brooklyn and New Jersey and have no family ties. And even women. And, even, you know, and then eventually you know, they started running out of men. Mm -hmm. And so they started bringing women on because they started to understand that this was completely out of balance. And there were, you know, a couple of lawsuits, I'm sure. So I came in 1974. I went to the management training program at Beige. I moved up very fast, was working for the chairman after about a year. He asked me what I, I did some things that he, you know, assignments that he wanted. He asked me what I wanted to do. I told him I wanted to trade municipal bonds. I ended up on the municipal bond trading desk. New York City was going bankrupt. I read the voluminous pages of documents, and I traded municipal bonds New York City bonds for about six months, and um, 
I did well. A lot of people did, but I was doing well. And coincidentally, one of their floor part, I, I was offered a job at another firm for more money. And I was about to take it. And one of the floor partners on the New York Stock Exchange left to go work for somebody else. But my boss, who was the vice chairman, said, I think we should put her on the floor. And it turned out that there was um, the, the ultimate chairman of the firm had heard uh, that the, we were number two at Beach, that somebody at Merrill Lynch was thinking of putting a woman on the floor. And you know, it all kind of came together very fast on a Friday afternoon. And uh, they called me in and they said, we, we wouldn't want to put you on the New York Stock Exchange. I said, wait a second, you, know, you have to make me an officer. I'm 25 years old. Um, there aren't any women that work down there. Muriel Siebert had bought a seat, but she never worked on the floor. I said, this is going to be a big shock for the system. And um, mm. why do you want to do it now? I mm -hmm. said, you've left your women home for 150 years. Why do you want to do it now? And there was this little voice, this older man, who said, um, Merritt Lynch is going to put a woman on the floor in six weeks. You're going to go Monday. <laughs> I see. And I, that made perfect sense yeah. to me. Yeah. And I, I said, OK. So I did. And, and I think that was my first turn at diplomacy. Because here I am, 25, and uh, you know there were men that were happy to see women, men that didn't care, but there were as an, there was an old guard, um, and they you know thought that the place was going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. So so you're saying that there was that, that it, there was opportunity, but but you were qualified, obviously, right. and and uh, and so what from that experience and that history inform you, uh, you know, in the Congress, M much of anything? Or I, think that, I think it's about risk. Mm -hmm. I think that I've been able to, from, from an early life, been able to look at a situation that I've been able to identify the risk, I've been able to calibrate the risk, and I've been able to mitigate the risk. And when I find a balance to that, then I know how to go. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've done some things in my life where people thought that was pretty risky, revolutionary. And I never considered it to be because I was able to think quickly and kind of say, okay, well, I, I'm actually going to a place where somebody else makes the market. I've been making a market in municipal bonds for six months. And my big challenge isn't whether I can do the job. My, my challenge is sociological, whether I can fit in. Mm -hmm. The test will be in, a, in six months, not whether I'm able to trade. I could do that. It's whether I have anybody to have lunch with. Mm -hmm. And about eight months into my being there, they, had, they were always raising money for charities. At the time I was on the floor from 1977 to 1980, I met some of the most extraordinary people in the world. And they would raise money. You know, there would be a fire in New York City or one of the boroughs, and they would raise um, $20,000 for the firefighter that perished. Um, extraordinary. And uh, so, th and they'd always have contests. So um, they actually, you know, had this contest, uh, and they, they actually had, were weighing me and somebody else and, you know, putting money in a, in a barrel, and they were going to give the money away to charity. And I knew then that I was accepted. And uh, I had some older members come to me toward the spring and say, you know, my, my granddaughter is, would like to come into the firm. You know, I've, I mm. don't know, um, you know, would you talk to her? And I said, um, seems like I should be talking to you. <laughs> and he, this one guy laughed and he said, uh, I guess so. <laughs> and I said, well, let me talk to her and see if she really wants to, and then I'll talk to you. It turned out that she ended up going into the firm and was president in four years. Uh, so I, I was going to ask you about leadership, but you uh, actually just defined uh, your notion of leadership in a way, this, this whole business about seeing the risk, and then, but, but seeing the risk in the context of a longer term that's right. or the long term. And, and that sounds like your father. That's right. Actually, that's right. in the grocery business. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it all looked familiar to me. And, um, you know, believe me, I've made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> but I've done it. Um, I've, I've, you know, some of the mistakes I've made were disappointing, but not surprising. Um, I knew that there were times when I was assuming more risk than I might. Uh, I, for whatever reason, 
I decided to do that. When it didn't work out, it wasn't like a big surprise. It was a disappointment. But um, it, you know, part of it is, and I try to teach my daughter this, um, capabilities and capacity are the two things you have to always understand about yourself. You should always be growing both. Um, in order to do that, you know, you have to understand your environment and, and what, what, what's important to you and what your, what your values are. You have to keep your values at the center of things. Um, but risk is really the barometer for how you're going to make choices. And if you assume more risk than you should, um, be aware that you have to balance the risk with capacity and capability. And so if you say, I'm going to do something, you know, I'm going to take on this new job, but, you know, my weaknesses are these two things, then you better move forward fast and get those things resolved. Whether you need to go to school to get another degree or whether you need to be spending time with somebody as a mentor who knows a lot more about it or whatever it is, getting to work an hour early, whatever it is, don't be confused that these things you identify don't have to get done. Just because you've identified them doesn't mean anything. You still have to do them. So, so in a way, it sounds like it's not about you. It's really about the problem That's right. and the problem in the context of the environment. That's right. Now, you were, once you're in Congress, you uh, uh, identified and were a centralist, basically. Yes. Yes. And th this is the problem that President Clinton confronted uh, mm -hmm. before he was elected, and that is moving the left wing of the party to the center. Right. Talk, that's a problem of leadership. Uh, talk a little about what, how you did that and what you learned from that experience. Well, I interpret it just slightly differently. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to move my left to the center. I want my left to stay where it is. But I want them to know that they need a center. I see. Um, and in many ways, the, the reason the center um, gets washed away at times, it's a bridge um, between, you know, these two fully formed, um, basically static places. And sometimes the bridge is very weak and, you know, can get taken out easily. And that's usually when these two places have moved a little bit further apart. This is the right and the left. The right and the, the left. left. Yeah. Because the right and the left are the are the um, are the north and south pole of, of political geography. And what the center is is um, the bridge between them. And and because this is about ideas, it should not be about ideology. It should be about ideas and values. And you know. It's easy to say one's right and one's wrong. That's, that's unfortunately easy, but not right. It's not correct. Both have uh, good pieces of, of, uh, of ideas uh, and of values that are, should, should be appreciated. The problem is when you lay politics over it and party over it, that's when we get into trouble. And um, so, you know, my progressive left is fundamentally important because that's a, a lot of my values are there, but at the same time, uh, we still have to get things done. And the only way you can get things done is through compromise. And you have to have a temperament for compromise. And you know, I think if I could be critical of the left too often, they they create sacred cows out of um, ideas and uh, out of goals and. The, the right has become Dr. No on everything. You, can't, you cannot so value an idea that you create it, make a sacred cow out of it so that it actually um, never becomes something that people can use and do. And incrementalism isn't a sin. But at the same time, you have to know when you have to stand your ground and you have to know when you have to stand up for things. And I think that, you know, I had a, a very progressive record. I had a 100% record with labor, 100% pro-choice record, 100% um, record on the environment. But, you know, for some people, I was not good enough because I was someone that was more interested in getting things done and finding ways to compromise than I was in feeling holy about 
uh, these positions. So, um, you know, I was lucky that not that many, not a majority of my constituents felt that way. Mm -hmm. So, so when when the tire hits the road, in in a way, you, you have to talk to the left wing of the, your party in a way you you talk to your constituents because right. they have concerns That's but right. you have to tell them well this is what we can do but we, right. we can't do more yeah and, and you know there are times when um, when compromise is the way to go forward because you are going forward and getting something and there are times when the compromise is, is too expensive and then and you have to say I'm sorry I, I'm not going to just take this deal to get too little um, because it's not going to mean enough and it's not going to be worth the compromise that I've made. Um, I think that that's happening a lot in politics now because there is this effort to really not do anything by, by the right. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're, this thing's going to turn and we're going to be back in the majority. I would celebrate so much the day that Nancy Pelosi is speaker again. Um, it's so unfortunate that she hasn't been speaker during these very tough times. But if you look at the time then which was she was speaker, um, I was in the House for most of that time. I was the presider over most of the bills that she brought to the floor mm -hmm. uh, that were controversial. And th this includes TARP, it includes the stimulus, it includes climate change. Every one of those bills, um, and plus many more. And um, it was my honor to be able to do that. And I, I liked doing it because she was so fundamentally important to be in her office, getting the votes, getting the deal done, getting everybody to agree, uh, whether it was Democrats or the Republicans, and working with the Senate to get it passed. But, um, you know, we, we need her leadership again. We need Democrats to be in the majority now because, unfortunately, the Republican Party has been colonized by nihilists. These are not people that are even for government. Mm -hmm. They're not even Republicans. Mm -hmm. And because of <laughs> gerrymandering, we have uh, a, a, a national scandal. We in California have finally gotten it right, and we have this two, two parts of it. We have the uh, independent commission that creates districts, but we also have the ability to elect people in a primary uh, and then have the two top vote getters, regardless of party, advance to the general. And um, you know that's a very, very important thing. If we had more of that in the country, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in right now with this deadlock in the Congress. The problem we have is that even though we've done it right in California, we can't be too smug about it because we only have 53 votes, not 218. Mm -hmm. So we need the rest of the country to begin to do what we're doing. And when people find out that gerrymandering creates a situation where they're, the member is fungible, but they're always only going to have a, a Republican and somebody that only has to deal with a primary, which causes them to only look to their right, not to the center, not to the general election population, but only to the primary. That just delivers the wrong kinds of people with the wrong kinds of temperament to Washington. Uh, it, it sounds like you're saying that uh, to do this work properly, putting aside the problem of the Republicans, that, that there has to be a commitment to the legitimacy of the center. That's right. And, That's right. and that is a, a value in itself. That's right. And it's where uh, idealism confronts reality. I think it's yes, and I think it's where um, I think it's where the rational part of of getting things done exists. You know, when I was an investment banker, um, two people sit on either side of the table, and oftentimes people come to the table with disproportional strength and weakness. And when there's one player who's dominant and one that's weak, the the the, the dominant part should understand that what they can't do is further weaken the weakened part. Because you may actually bend those people over. You may actually knock them over. You may actually get more than you deserve. But nobody in that room will ever want to do a deal with you again. Now, you may not want to do a deal again, but there are people in that room that will. Mm -hmm. And so it's while you're doing that deal, it's about doing the next deal and the deal after that. Not so much that you are um, caving in, you have to stand for what's right, but in order to get a good deal, that means both people have to leave with grace and class and their dignity preserved. 
mm -hmm. and that you are doing the best you can to have success. And that means sometimes you leave a little on the table. That means you don't grab something just because you can. And that means that you have to have the integrity of the deal, something that lives on behind you. Because th this is about people. And that's true in business. It's true in the Congress. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in a way, the, a, a way to analyze the Republican the Republicans in quotes, because mm -hmm. the question is, are they really traditional Republicans? Right. Is that they are not? Uh, uh, they are well. You said anarchists. They yep, are absolutely. records right. of the center, government. and right. and and now uh, that they have come into dominance. On the one hand, you've identified the pro problem of gerrymandering and problem, but is this also a failure of the moderate Republicans, yes. of the leaders who do not see the legitimacy of the center? Well, it, it's the success of gerrymandering, mm -hmm. which is done, you know, very much in you know the, the classic old smoke-filled room behind the door that nobody ever knows exists. Most people don't even understand how gerrymandering happens. Most people don't understand that it happens in the year between the census, which is the zero year, and the one year when, when the deals are made about it. But it's done by political parties, and it's done for the gain of the political party. It's not done for, um, to make sure that constituents are represented well, or that there's balance and fairness. It's not done for that reason at all. It's done so that the parties actually have majorities. And that's, that's the, I think the bad thing about it, and, and that's the thing that has caused, you know, frankly, maybe I wouldn't feel so bad if my party had won over the last 50 years. We didn't win redistricting in 70, 80, 90, 2000, or 2010. I'm, I'm done. I'm ready to change. <laughs> and I'm happy to see that in California, we figured it out. But the rest of the country, which is dominated with over 30 Republican governors who run 30 different states that have 30 opportunities to do redistricting, they've made it so that their party, it dominates. You know, in the last election, Democrats in the congressional election got a million more votes in the country. But it didn't matter. And it didn't matter. And how does that, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. And it's possible because it's rigged. And that's the only way to call it. It's rigged. And people don't understand it because all they see is all of a sudden that they're now not in the 10th district, but they're in the 7th, and they're, you know, the representative isn't somebody they've known for the last eight years, but somebody new from next door. And they think, well, gee, how did that happen? Okay. Well, then they understand. They can't. That, that guy can go away. God could take him away. A bus could take him away. They can't take him away. He could resign. But he's going to be replaced by somebody just like him, mm -hmm. because the system is only going to deliver up somebody from the extreme end of the party, because gerrymandering has said all they have to do is care about somebody more extreme in a primary, because they never have to face a general election. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, what, and, and this problem leads to a situation where, in this recent confrontation, these uh, Ego-driven uh, uh, partisans who basically are, are focused on uh, the, the narrowest constituency right. essentially were about to wreck right. our role in the world right. by calling into question America as a reserve currency, right. all to uh, um, re-legislate right. legislation that had already been passed. Well, that, that's part of it. They, they, these are anti-government people. Mm. They're not going to Washington to sit at a table. They're going to Washington to break the table. They don't have no interest in, interest in negotiation. They're not for any of that stuff. So when you're sending people that don't have a temper for compromise and aren't for a government, guess what you get? You get a shutdown that was absolutely precipitated by ego and by bipartisanship. Um, $20 billion, you know, removed out of the economy for no reason whatsoever, uh, perhaps a recovery in March. I mean, this is just ridiculous. When you think of the people that are unemployed and the people struggling right now, um, the uncertainty added to the business community, all to get rid of a health care program that they never supported, that they have no alternative for. 
-hmm. They're perfectly willing to have 35 million people without health care. Well, I'm not for them. They're not for me. They're not for anybody they're but not themselves. Well, they're not for anybody. But they are, uh, you know, let, let's, let's be fair. They're legitimate. They've been legitimately elected because we have allowed the system to be narrowly defined in a way so that they actually have the way to get in the door. And most people's votes are nullified because most people vote in the general election. Doesn't matter, they could all show up because that person is not going to get taken out of office. So, so what, what is, what, in a, in a, do we have to go from disaster to disaster, fiasco to fiasco, until there is enough of a mobilization to overturn these Apparently, the system? Apparently, do you ever watch one of those um, new movies? Um, I love them because they're just a disaster and loud and banging. <laughs> Um, I think of one of those transformer ones where you think it's almost over and then somebody else comes out. Well, we apparently haven't hit bottom yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, apparently we haven't. I mean, let's face it. We've only moved the, 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 the goalposts. Uh, we have another deadline January 15th for the budget. We have another deadline February 7th for the debt ceiling. You know, this is, this is not done. We haven't done anything to resolve this. All we've done is temporarily caused a ceasefire. So we are now going to you know, going to go through the holidays. On January 15th, we're going to have to do something about the continuing resolution because we don't have a budget because they won't vote for one. We don't have a debt ceiling decision. We're now February 7th. So it's it's all we do is just kick the can down the street and add more uncertainty. Uh, add more uncertainty to our own economic situation, add more less credibility to ourselves around the world. And uh, I think it's an unfortunate set of circumstances. So, so you went on to have a distinguished diplomatic career representing uh, the U.S. in arms control and in uh, talks on uh, missile defense. So was this a piece of cake now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> negotiating with the Russians after your description of, of uh, the, the new Republicans? Well, you know, I was really, uh, I was very blessed because uh, when I was in the Congress, I was on the Transportation Committee and the Armed Services Committee, and I was the senior Bay Area person on both committees. I represented the two nuclear labs at, in Livermore, Livermore and, and California, Sandia. Uh, I, uh, when we became into the majority, I chaired the Strategic Forces Subcommittee on Armed Services, which is a $55 billion portfolio that includes all of the nuclear weapons complex, space satellites, missile defense, what we call the overhead architecture. Um, and I did that for three years before I became undersecretary. I did not expect to be undersecretary uh, for lots of reasons, including the fact that I was a Hillary supporter, and still am. And uh, so I was surprised. But she, when she became secretary of state, she was one of the few cabinet people that could say, I want so-and-so. And the president uh, wanted me to come over. And uh, I, I you know, was very surprised. I also had to give up my seat, which was... Um, you know, caused you know some angst for me, but I believed that I could be helpful to get the treaty. We had a treaty that the big treaty, the START treaty, expiring in December of 2009. The president was taking office in January of 2009, uh, and in the end, um, we did get the treaty. We had to get it uh, confirmed by the Senate for, with 67 votes, and it was um, it was not a layup. It was not a layup with the Russians. It was not a layup to get it ratified, but we ended up doing it. And, and, and did your the, the negotiating skills that that you had just described uh, did, did they carry over and and really help you do this work? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we were stuck. We 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 had uh, a very good negotiator who was one of my assistant secretaries, Rose Gottemuller, who was about hopefully to be confirmed as my successor after 18 months as undersecretary. But she was in Geneva working with a big team. The Russians had a very uh, distinguished negotiator, Anatoly Antonov. And we were then stuck. We, we were stuck, and the treaty expired, and we were stuck. And then I, uh, I went over, and um, both uh, Jim Jones, who was the uh, National Security Advisor, and, and Secretary Clinton and the White House agreed that I would go over and try to break through. And um, I went over, and uh, the first weekend, we ended up, we had about six issues that were very intransigent, and then I, I broke through uh, one and two, and then came back and got more guidance at the White House, and then went back, and 33 days later, we had a treaty. And, and it sounds like it, some of the rules that you just defined for 
negotiation right. about respecting the other party yes. and, and yes. giving them something and, yes. and coming up with a compromise. Yes. yes. One of the things from Wall Street that I brought along with me was when we actually got the treaty done, uh, we, we had about two weeks to get everything put together and then the president had us all go to Prague where he'd given the Prague speech in April of 2009 which was a seminal speech about about nuclear weapons where he said he wanted to um, eliminate nu nuclear weapons over time, that he wanted to be, uh, would take patient, patience and persistence and might not happen in his lifetime, but that was his goal. He wanted a treaty with the Russians to be able to take down weapons in an orderly way with verification and inspections in a transparent way. And that was, you know, we were negotiating the treaty then. A year later, we have the treaty negotiated. We go to Prague on that day and he and President Medvedev signed the treaty. Um, we then sent uh, Assistant Secretary Gottemuller and uh, Deputy um, Foreign Minister Antonov on a road show. And basically, unlike what happened in the past where everybody would go back to their capital and say, boy, did I take him to the cleaners <laughs> mm -hmm. and cause all kinds of problems, we sold the treaty together because it was our treaty. And so we didn't go back and have people say crazy things that only cause problems in the, in the two states ratifying. And we didn't take an attitude of, you know, well, I won and they were stupid. We did what we should have done, which was responsible, which was to talk about our treaty and why our treaty was important to us. And we sent them to London and Paris and Brussels and Rome and New York uh, and other allies. We, we met with the P5, which includes obviously not only the Russians and us and the British and the French, but the Chinese. And, um, you know, we got a, a huge coalition and then we worked it in the United States. We, I, I myself called um, 60 or 70 different newspapers around the country and said, this is why this is a good treaty. If you agree, please write. If you don't, please don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we got positive editorials around the country in red, purple, and blue states. And in the end, we knew we had about 73% of the people with us. And we ended up needing 67 votes and got 71. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, during this period that, that you actually had an illness, actually, you, you uh, and, but you kept going uh, behind the scenes, so to speak. Well, yeah, I, I, um, I found out in July, so this was, this was uh, you know, January, February, March, April, we signed the treaty. May, June, May, June, July, we're working on it. I was actually working on some other things with the Russians, and I was, I was actually coming back from a trip to Pakistan when I realized that I felt as if I had something causing me to not digest very easily, and I went to the doctors, and I found out that I had high stage three esophageal cancer, mm. and, um, you know, that we had to move very fast. I was in treatment in about seven days. I had eight rounds of chemo, 25 rounds of radiation, and then I had surgery to remove my esophagus and reshape my stomach into a smaller stomach esophagus. And um, that I was actually in the hospital when the vote came down for, uh, we were in lame duck session. This was, my surgery was December 3rd. I was in the hospital till December 24th. But on December 21st and 2nd, my last bill in the house, which was the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, got passed. And then later that day, um, both John Kerry and, and Secretary Clinton called, and the White House called, and I, um, they were going to send the New Star Treaty to the floor. And um, you know, I said, "We have the votes; just do it." And we got six, we got seventy-one votes. What, what did you learn from that experience that took you to a higher level than you had uh, learned from all of these fulfilling careers? Um, I think I learned that I still could intellectualize even the most frightening of problems and that I could, um, that I was strong enough to manage the, the issues and that I could still use my risk model to understand, you know, I knew very quickly that this was really bad and that, that I could just look at the faces of the people telling me they were scared and I thought, well, okay, you, you be scared, I'll just pay attention and I'll make decisions. You mm -hmm. have to be an advocate. That means you have to educate yourself on what, what the issues are. And I figured out pretty, pretty early on that this Sloan Kettering protocol, which was the eight rounds of chemo and the 25 rounds of radiation, it was perversely funny that I'm the president's arms control <laughs> negotiator and I'm basically meant to rid the world of these 
weapons of mass destruction, but I'm using chemical weapons and radiological weapons to kill my cancer, so arms control, <laughs> you know, forget it. But, um, you know, I, I knew that the variable was my surgeon, because I had to have my esophage, esophagus removed and everything done, and, and that I, I also knew that I wanted to have a recovery that approximated my life, that I had quality of life. And so I knew what I was going to ask people, and I'm lucky I have, you know, 434 friends around the country that are members of Congress. I have, you know, great senators, and everybody wanted me to go to their place. But a couple of doctors that I met said the same thing to me. If it was me or my wife, I'd go to Duke University and go to Dr. Tommy D'Amico. Mm. And so one of them said, I'll call him. So I went down to see him uh, on one of the week breaks that I had between chemo and radiation. and. Um, I immediately was convinced that he wasn't the kind of swashbuckler surgeon that I'd met before and that um, that he was the guy to do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he said, I'd love to do your surgery. Do you mind? Would you let me? And I was like, yeah, okay. And so I was driving toward that goal and getting myself, you know, the chemo was really brutally brutalizing. The radiation was worse. But then I had about four weeks between to get myself strong. I hadn't been, really been able to eat because I had this mass in my chest. So I had lost a lot of weight, but I felt as if I was strong between my ears and that I knew what I had to do. And, um, you know, with my friends and my family supporting me, I got through it. One final question uh, after that moving account of, of your experience. Uh, how would you advise students to prepare for the future uh, as somebody who's been in business, who's been in Congress, who's been a diplomat, and, and who, who survived an awful illness? I think um, as I can only tell them what I would tell my daughter, um, what I do tell my daughter. Um, you know, life is really about making sure that when you, when you do the sum total of it, that you um, have represented yourself in a, in, a, in a faithful and integrity way, that you, that you are, are happy with the things that have happened, whether those are decisions that you've made or even the mistakes, that in the end, um, they were, if there were sins, they're venal sins, and that they are, um, that they are things that were just part of life. And that you, that you learn how to trust yourself. And if you don't trust yourself, understand why and, and get better skills, get better ways of managing things, because life is a series of um, unexpected and unpredictable things, and you can't be ready for what they are, you can only be ready for how you can manage them. And you have to be able to trust yourself because you're going to find yourself in circumstances where you turn and you want to ask somebody and there's nobody there. And really, you only have yourself. You, and you have to be true to yourself. If you're true to yourself and you're honest and you're, and you're faithful to um, just being a strong in person of integrity, you will do well for others. Well, on that note, Ellen, uh, thank you very much for sharing this uh, remarkable account of all of these uh, different uh, experiences. And, uh, and thank you for coming to the campus to be the Matsui Lecturer. Oh, it's my Lecture. pleasure, Harry. It was fun. Okay, and thank you again. Thank and you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.